We are recording. Okay, there, welcome David? everybody. Okay. Um, thank you for your patience. Uh, we are using technology. It doesn't always work the way that we want it to, but we're happy to be able to connect and have you with us here today. I'm Sam Small. With us today is uh, Juanita Thompson, uh, who will be here in audio only, not picture. Uh, David Marin uh, is with us as well, and uh, we will be presenting uh, content on medical massage therapy. I'm going to turn it right over to David. Thank you, Sam. Well, hello, everybody. And Sam is in Maui, Hawaii. I am in San Miguel de Allende, Mexico. And Juanita is in Dattle, New Mexico. So we are separated by a few thousand miles, each of us, and from you as well. And yet, through the marvels of technology, here we are. So today, we want to speak about some terms that are commonly used in our practice, both relating to muscles and nerves. And I wanted to start it off by saying and reminding you all and welcome you, all, everybody, um, that in your manual and on the videos, you've heard the terms neuropathy, entrapment neuropathy, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to talk a little bit, start with nerves and then bring in Juanita and we're going to talk, out, talk about muscles. Um, neuropathy means a problem with a nerve. Poly, ner neuropathy is divided into polyneuropathy, meaning affecting many nerves, and mononeuropathy, affecting generally one nerve, mono. So polyneuropathy defines quite well uh, what we understand as peripheral neuropathy that's associated with diabetes, with lupus, with other systemic type diseases or disorders that involve many nerves and can accurately, accurately be called a polyneuropathy. The terms that you and I use in class and I use in the manual about an entrapment neuropathy or an impingement neuropathy or a compression neuropathy, those three terms are generally considered to be more or less interchangeable. Uh, those are mononeuropathies generally encompassing one nerve. Think carpal tunnel syndrome for a perfectly good example of one nerve being entrapped, impinged, and or compressed by the nine muscles and the, that go through the carpal tunnel. So that's a mononeuropathy, and you hear me speak many times about entrapment neuropathies. For me, I would like to suggest, this is not official, just I would like to suggest that that I think of an entrapment neuropathy as involving muscle, that's muscle all around the nerve and is entrapping it. When I think of it, when I hear the word impingement, I often associate that in my mind only, and I'm not quoting a textbook here, this is just my um, impression that I'm sharing with you. And Juanita will have her own impression to share as well. When I think impingement, I think well, maybe it's some soft tissue, but one of, one of the sides that's compressing or that's affecting that nerve is a bony surface or a hard surface. And so it's an impingement, something being pushed up against something hard. And then there's compression neuropathy, as in a thoracic outlet syndrome, where in the inferior cord, if you recall, which gives rise to the which nerve? The ulnar nerve is the one that's most often compressed by the rib and first rib, or between the first rib and the uh, clavicle. So those three terms we are pretty familiar with, and that's how I use them, just to say it in, in that way. So polyneuropathy, uh, diabetic problems, and with many nerves, and clearly, if we uh, have a client in our, on our table that has a polyneuropathy, our approach is going to be very different, and I'm going to let Juanita speak to that more than I, because her background more correctly covers polyneuropathy. My background covers mostly mononeuropathies like cubital tunnel syndrome or piriformis syndrome or a variety of myalgia parasitica, where a, ner a nerve, in, in the case of myalgia parasitica, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, one specific branch of one specific nerve 
is entrapped by soft tissue, muscular tissue. And therefore, we hope to be very successful in going in there and helping an entrapment or an impingement or even possibly a compression neuropathy. So I want to lay the groundwork in that respect. And I want, to th want you to think of the, uh, of the nerve or the nerve flow, nerve impulses like electricity. You know, the electricity to your fridge is going to work just fine unless you unplug it. If it's unplugged for any reasons, the fridge goes dead. So in this case, if the muscle is, if the nerve is dead, the, 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 the muscle doesn't get any, any activity at all. If in fact it's diminished, it gets some impulses, impulses through the nerve. But I want you to think of electric impulses and nerve impulses as being fairly similar. Maybe someone is as old as I am and can remember back in early TV when they would show you a picture of someone standing on a tube and say we have trouble on the cable. So that's what I'm referring to when I'm saying <laughs> that uh, it's like uh, that kind of an entrapment neuropathy. So we start with that, that idea. And, and much of what we do is, is as you recall, I, you heard me say a couple of things many times I would trust, and that is one, that um, a tight muscle is by definition the result of an overactive nervous system. Well, I'm going to correct that a little bit and say that a tight muscle or hypertonic muscle is often, often a result of an overactive nerve. Because if a nerve gets impinged or, in, or entrapped or compressed, what is it going to do? Is it going to wither and die? No. It is going to set off more, more impulses at a faster rate. The speed goes up and every single impulse, as you know, goes to the muscle and says, contract. So that, that pain, pain, spasm, spasm pain, pain cycle is there. It's a matter of fact. Dr. Cayette uh, has written books on the pain, spasm, pain, pain cycle, and that's exactly what he's referring to. The continual uh, increasing by the tension in the muscle, increasing more nerve flow, more nerve flow, increasing more tension in the muscle. So that's what we're dealing with very often, not always. In a, in a polyneuropathy situation like diabetes, it's a very different approach. I have a, my personal examples, our, our experience with that is a client who would say, David, your nice relaxing massage did so wonderful on my legs and my ankles and my, my calves on a diabetic gentleman who's 70 years old. And it just felt great and it lasted for about a day and a half and then it came back. So that is a palliative treatment, and we want to take that in, in, um, and give that every consideration that we can from that point of view, that it is palliative, we need to be very cautious, and we will do so in a uh, clinical manner. So that's the distinction between polyneuropathy and mononeuropathy, entrapment, impingement, and compression neuropathy. I want to set the stage with that. And then the other phrase that I often use and have, and I want to amend that slightly as well, and that is to say that everything we do in a session is designed to do one thing, essentially, and that is to calm or slow down the nervous system. And that is mostly true. Not always, however. Not always. There will be other situations which Juanita can address better than I with her nursing background and with her intense study of the things that we're going to present today. So I want you to know that. I want you to realize that our desire is to soothe, calm, and slow down the nervous system in every case. And yet there are many times where there's many other things that are operative too in that realm as a person is on our table with a painful problem. So let me touch my notes one minute. And to say to you that... I think I'm going to bring Juanita in right now, having set the stage for that, and we'll start off talking maybe a little more about nerve if she chooses, and maybe we'll jump right into sure. some terms relative to muscle physiology. Juanita. Okay. Thank you, David, for that good uh, uh, foundation, and it gives me uh, uh, a chance to add a little bit to some of the things that you have said. Please. Um, Yes, with respect to the uh, the nerve entrapment, impingement, and compression, um, looking at different textbooks, 
I have found through the years that they're not all consistent. And so I wanted to add a few more uh, explanations to those words. Um, entrapment definitely is a nerve that is being um, uh, pressed upon by soft tissue. And the only thing I want to add that David said is that sometimes that soft tissue could be scar tissue or it could be um, an arthritic change that is sort of uh, connected onto a tendinous area. Um, so those are also soft tissues. Fascia is a soft tissue that mm -hmm. can scar and can bind, especially within uh, muscles themselves. When we have uh, a tear in a muscle, the fascia often that is surrounding each muscle fiber can scar and tiny little nerve endings can be entrapped by that scar tissue as well as the muscular tissue. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to add that. With respect to uh, impingement, impingement is a word that I have seen used in so many different ways and my, <laughs> my uh, final impression of the word impingement is that some, a nerve is being pressed upon and maybe people don't know what is really pressing on it. Maybe, maybe it's something bony, maybe it's a bone spur, maybe it's uh, a, another type of arthritic change, maybe it's muscle tissue or scar tissue, uh, and that when that term is used, I always kind of get the impression that they're not really sure what's causing it. Maybe all of that is causing it. After injury, there can be so many things within one injury that could be pressing upon a nerve. The word compression definitely is connected with more bony tissue. And uh, one that uh, David didn't mention, although I know he knows this to be true, is in the spine when we talk about discs. You know, disc is a special type of uh, um, uh, bone tissue uh, and that can herniate. And certainly we know about herniations and ruptures that uh, can press upon nerves. And that's, you know, con considered a compression also, even though it, it may not be an actual bone as we think of it. So I think of compression as, uh, as anything that is bony, whether it would be a disc or uh, arthritic change or bone spurs that might come as a result of scar tissue from a bone. So was there anything you wanted to add to that, David, and do you pretty much agree with what I've said? In total, and I did want to, you gave me, you gave us a chance to distinguish between or, or to mention two terms in which you did. Uh, and I want to talk about herniating and rupturing and bulging just for a moment. A, a, okay. disc, a disc begins to bulge, or the technical term is it begins to herniate. That disc continues to herniate or bulge, used interchangeably in my experience, and I want you to comment on this, of course, when I finish. Uh, it uh -huh. continues to bulge or herniate until it gets to the point where it is touching the nerve so much, and maybe the, the annular ring breaks and the nuclear material leaves. That way, in that case, the disc has herniated or ruptured. So I, I see those two terms as interchangeable. I didn't look this up to confirm my, my statement here, but I have always thought that herniating and, and bulging are the same. And herniated, I have a herniated disc or a, a ruptured disc or a, yes, in, in my back. So I've used those terms interchangeably. Would you agree with that? You know, David, it's so interesting. Uh, I remember we had this discussion in Oregon about five years ago. And oh, I'm we not did. sure that we, yeah, we did. Okay. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I think we took some time trying to look things up. And I think what we came up with was that different texts defined herniated and herniating in different ways. And so oh. we didn't, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so And sometimes that happens with information. Sometimes it happens with words and you go from textbook to textbook and um, things might, you know, have a different 
type of um, uh, definition, depending on who's writing it. So, uh, no. but one thing is for sure: we we know what a bulging disc is. We know what happens when it it ruptures, and uh, uh, so we may not be too clear on the difference between herniated and herniating, but uh, we pretty much know the concept and know that it can certainly press on those spinal nerves. For sure. Got it. Agreed. Right. Okay. So uh, let's see. There was a, a couple of other things I wanted to mention. Uh, David was talking about the, the neurological flow uh, being very much like electricity. And I want to give you all a word that you may or may not have heard of. And the word is axoplasmic. A X O P L A S M I C. Axoplasmic flow. And this is the actual name of the neurological flow <clears throat> that travels from the brain to the spinal cord to the peripheral nerves and then back again up to the, the brain. And uh, this was something new to me when I learned about this, but there is an actual normal speed to the axoplasmic flow. <clears throat> Just like everything in the body has a particular speed to it, our heartbeat and you know, when we breathe, the rate of digestion and peristalsis and uh, so forth and so on, even cranial sacral flow, um, there's also a normal flow to the nervous system. It can slow down and it can speed up. And they have figured out that, you know, what is it that speeds up the axoplasmic flow? Certainly stress of any kind, whether it be emotional or mental, whether it be physical overuse, whether it be pain. Um, so, and like David was saying, when, when a nerve is being uh, pressed upon, it often will speed up trying to uh, regain the flow. And so this is important. I don't have any numbers. I've never seen any rate of exoplasmic flow. But we do know now that that type of neurological activity can become habitual so that instead of having a nice normal uh, moderate rate of the axoplasmic flow that we can have an extreme fast rate and that can become habitual and that's what we see when and when people are under stress for a long period of time the result of that uh, with real extreme stress we now call uh, um, you know, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, where the nervous system is moving so quickly and affecting everything in the body, not just muscles, but all of our organ systems as well. Um, let's see. I also want. Does that mean to, what? That's is that is that what they mean when they say a person is really wired? Yes, absolutely, and we all know that. I, you know, we have people on our table that that twitch and. Uh, you know, are so nervous that they can't seem to lie still. I, I have a few go. clients like that right now, right? They can't let go, and they're just, uh, yes, and, and it's a habitual type of loop that occurs in the nervous system, and we know now that there's things that can slow it down, massage being one of the best, I believe, definitely. I get, massage is one of the best. Can I jump in and say that I wonder if everyone yes. has noticed that when you have a person on your table that can't let go, the last thing you want to say is relax. Right. Because <laughs> they don't know that they're not relaxed. It yes. helps. Sometimes it might help to say breathe. But that's yes. about the only thing that I've found that really helps. I have clients today, just right now, today, that cannot, and I mean cannot let go. They always yes. hold on. And yes. it really restricts the treatment. It really makes it into a less than desirable experience for the therapist, for sure. And, and I will just quickly jump in and say the things that we use the most to help the nervous system relax is heat. The use of heat is a, a very, very good way to begin the muscle tone relaxing and, and sending back information to the brain that, you know, the body is beginning to relax. Um, application of touch where you're just your hands are, are underneath someone's head 
You're just holding the head, you're breathing, you're asking them to breathe, you're not doing anything but just touching them, and then you're relaxing and communicating your relaxation through your hands. That's a very good way. And a lot of times when we do that, people will sigh, take a deep breath without you even telling them to. They just, uh, it, it feels so calming. It's, it's sort of like you're, you're literally calming them down with your touch. And that's one of the reasons why massage therapists need to be pretty relaxed people. Because <laughs> we communicate that through our hands and through our own breath. I agree um, wholeheartedly. The, and I want to yes. add to that, follow that up by saying that when I go to, tr- when I go to treat someone, the last thing that I want to do is, with that kind of person or with that person is to lift something up because that for sure they're going to tighten up. I find that right. if I place, let's say I place both, my, let's say they're supine and I place both my hands on their right shoulder, right arm. If I just start pushing and moving them a little bit without lifting the arm, it's fine. But if I go to lift the arm up, oops, there they are again, right yes, on, right yes. on target. <laughs> that nervous system will engage right into that type of uh, holding pattern. Um, and another one that we do so much in our course, and I, I do this with every client that I see, it's the movement and the jiggling and the shaking and the, uh, the rolling of the joints jostling. and of the body. The jostling, jostling. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, we saw that in Milton Traeger's work. Uh, Absolutely. He, that was pretty much what was all done in Absolutely. that work. And it sends really interesting neurological messages to the brain. It and does. people cannot keep up with that. They cannot, the body cannot try to do that. And, um, and it takes a while for people to get used to being uh, uh, massaged in that way and moved in that way. But it can really lead to some tremendous letting go of the neurological system. So um, in talking, uh, uh, one other word I wanted to throw out to you is the word paresthesia. Um, the seizure means sensation, and para is partial. And so when people begin to have neuropathy, often their symptoms are symptoms of paresthesia. This means that only partial sensation, partial nerve flow is getting through. And, you know, they may say they have some numbing or pins and needles, and sometimes they'll have a, a sharp kind of stabbing thing that that you know might go down a lot an arm or a leg and so this this is this definitely the symptoms of um, an interrupted neurological or axoplasmic flow um, let's see and one then, thing I'll uh, throw uh, in Juanita the uh-huh. the com- the term uh, numbing and tingling a little jo- yes. medical jargon is that often uh, I've heard medical professionals and certainly therapy teachers use the combination of numbling, numbing and tingling (laughs) together, numbling. Okay. All right. Very interesting. Um, And so then David was talking about the mononeuropathy and the polyneuropathy. And sometimes that can be a bit confusing in that they may present, for, for instance, with a Um, a situation that seems like a carpal tunnel syndrome from their symptoms and then we think, oh, well, that's the the median nerve, you know, that's a mononeuropathy type of situation. However, there are some conditions, especially, well, not especially, but all over the body that begin closer to the spine. For instance, with someone who has carpal tunnel syndrome, it's very important to get a history if they've had a history of neck problems, they've had whiplash, neck injuries, they have postural distortions of their neck, what happens is we remember that brachial plexus uh, comes off of the spine, and so we have more than one nerve that may be affected um, by the spine. The brachial plexus may be affected by uh, the scalene. It's hard to say, but it's higher up on the nerve chain, and so. When that occurs, when we have injuries or problems higher up, this can affect the nerves that are below it. And so a person might have symptoms of carpal tunnel, but they may have what we call a double crush syndrome, which means that the nerves higher up are uh, uh, um, affecting 
the, the median nerve, for instance, and it makes the median nerve more vulnerable. So that person who may be a massage therapist or a carpenter, you know, would wind up developing the symptoms of carpal tunnel, and yet the origin of it uh, may be polyneuropathy because there's more going on that begins at the neck and understanding the history and, and treating from the neck down instead of just the localized area um, makes a tremendous difference in the results that they will get over a period of time. Let me jump in right oh. there, Juanita. I'll refer okay. everyone to your manual. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> if I can't remember which manual, I would think it would be the second one or the first one, number one. But we talk about, uh, I mean, the, that research study from 1973 is mentioned at, where they established that someone who's had a, let's say, a, a cervical radiculopathy, a problem in their, in, their, in their neck or with the brachial plexus, as she says, in, exiting the thorax, and that makes them more susceptible to uh, an, something, another problem along the same distribution of that same nerve. So that's right. exactly what Juanita is saying, that if someone has had a cervical uh, radiculopathy or a problem with the brachial plexus up at the, at the thorax, it makes them more susceptible to problems later on in the same right. nerve. Yes, very, very much so. And, uh, and treating the whole area is just uh, so very important. Um, and then the only other thing uh, before we go on to another topic, you were talking about the um, you know the intention of our massage work to be for relaxation and to change muscle tone to be uh, more of a a normal muscle tone uh, for many reasons and um, but I just wanted to add in that there are some things that we do in massage therapy that are more vigorous and could even be considered more stimulating um, for instance. Uh, uh, f f deep friction, topodement, both of those types of uh, therapies are initially very stimulating to the tissue and uh, we have to be careful that we don't go too deep and so forth. Sometimes we do that in order to uh, change what might be perceived as hypertone muscle or scar tissue under the area and we really want to uh, warm it up and see if we can then uh, stretch it and change the tissue to some extent. Sometimes that results in what they call an intentional inflammation. People might be sore the next day or the day after that from it. And most of the time, uh, it's because of the, the stimulating work that we do. And as you know, sometimes this is just really necessary uh, to be able to get into tissues to try to affect the change of the tone itself. So uh, just wanted to add that in there, David. Juanita, and, I might even uh, add to your list. Would we add to that list possibly something that we uh, advocate uh, first or very soon in a, in a treatment area is uh, skin rolling. That could be not right. so relaxing either. And yet it promotes That's right. <laughs> in the end result, hopefully it promotes a relaxation approach. That's right. And you know, even cold, even application of cold, uh, even though it it has also a sedating effect because it eventually numbs. Bef before we get to the numbing area, uh, a time you know where the nerves are really uh, depressed, it's pretty stimulating, and a lot of people don't like it. Uh, we tell people when we're we're doing ice massage, for instance, that it might ache and throb before it goes numb. You know, so on the way to the therapeutic effect of it numbing an area, you know, we go through a very stimulating uh, result of ice application also. Okay, uh, last thing I just wanted to mention with neuropathy in general, we often think of neuropathy and the, um, the symptoms of neuropathy as being more sensory that uh, you know we're we're feeling less um, less sensation in our hands or in our feet. However, the motor nerves can also be affected, and I bring this up because with individuals that have chronic disease like uh, like diabetes or uh, other conditions that affect the nervous system, 
the motor nerves can also be affected over time. And this can really affect the, um, the strength of the muscles themselves, um, sometimes the actual proprioception, uh, and remember that word proprioception is our sense of where we are in space. It's because of our proprioception that we have in our nervous system and in the muscular areas that we know where to walk, how to walk, we avoid bumping into things, and our proprioception is very important. This can really be affected uh, with neuropathy over time, and this is one of the reasons why people are seen to kind of be shuffling their feet, uh, and they stumble, they don't have good balance, they run into things, and uh, that's also part of the effect of a prolonged neuropathy that degenerates both sensory and motor nerves. And probably okay. the cause of so. quite a few purchases of canes. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. And walkers, and you know, walkers. because they just need the support. Yeah. And the confidence. Okay, David. So I think I'm pretty much done with everything that you mentioned, if you want mm -hmm. another no, topic. No, I'm good. Okay, so you're, are, are you... Um, are we opening things up to questions at this point? We have 20 minutes on this call. We so certainly can open to that? questions, sure. We can open okay. to questions. We have more right. material that we had planned to present, as I will say. But we can do it on other calls. I, I think this is important, and we can get some feedback from you all that are listening as to whether you find this to be valuable. We appreciate your feedback for sure. If um, I don't know if you folks see the chat, uh, uh, you're welcome to post your questions there or let me know that you have a question and I can open your microphone and uh, we'll take our chance and make uh, see if the sound works well. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but uh, if uh, you have a question, uh, you can raise your hand. I might be able to see you on the screen um, and uh, we'll give it a try. Uh, Gene, I'm going to unmute you and let's see how it goes. Hi, Gene. Hi there. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Great to, to have you on the call again. Thank you very much for your commitment to this fine work. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate everything you guys are doing. So I have a uh, patient at the clinic that uh, has drop foot uh, neuropathy in the foot and the leg. And, you know, I'm, I'm frustrated because I want to get results of course, quicker than, than, than we are. And he's not in often enough to, uh, to see the results happening as, as well as we would like. But I was just wondering if you have any advice uh, as far as uh, technique, uh, anything that I could do that maybe might help to speed up the recovery process for him or even if it's possible to, to, to get it better. Um, I, can I ask a question? Do they know what's causing the neuropathy? Um, he has, well, I know he has Parkinson's, but I don't know if that is the underlining cause of the problem. Right. Okay. That, that'd be a well, question Parkinson's, you'd want to find out. Yeah, yes. It's, and it's been a while. He was, he was gone for over a month. Um, and he just got back and I didn't, I didn't get a chance to work on it today. He just came in for an adjustment. Um, but uh, it made me think about him, and, and it's been a while. I would have gotten on to the uh, last month's call when he was, when he was in town, and, and now that it's been so long, I'm trying to remember everything about him. So it just seeing him today right. pop that up and, and then you uh, touching on this subject matter, uh, I thought would be a really good time to ask about that. Sure, sure. So I, I've got a few suggestions uh, with... Um, with neuropathy in general, and by the way, there are some neuropathies that are totally mysterious and people don't know what causes them. Uh, so just so that you know that, they're unspecified neuropathies and it, and it may be something that is, um, you know, a toxin in the body or whatever. However, when we have a, a, a neuropathy and we know that there's an interruption in the neurological flow, um, it, I think with chronic problems like probably your client has and diabetics and uh, other people too, um, one of the best things that can be done overall 
is to um, when when you're with them to be able to work on the area repeatedly for at least 10 minutes of time. If you can proceed it by some type of heat, that would be very good. However, for people that are suffering with this, you know, a massage does just so much. And for them to be able to get more relief would be to be able to teach someone who is in their home how to do some simple massage on the extremities if that's where the problem is and to be able to do it every day. If it's a feet, to have them, you know, soak their feet in some warm water first or to get into a bathtub and directly after that period of time have the person that they're living with do some simple massage for five minutes. It does not take that long in order to stimulate the nerves and to move the blood. And doing that as often as possible will give people quite a bit of relief. Great. Thank so you. there you okay. get to be the teacher, Jean. See, That's we're not right. only a therapist, right. we're a teacher, we're a coach, we're a consultant. We, we perform yeah. many functions for our clients. We are constantly yeah. coaching, that's for sure. And it's not on your shoulders to fix him. That's right. And it so can't you be, be the consultant. It can just be managed. Exactly. Yeah, it can be managed, and the more, the better. And to me, Gene, that's the most frustrating client of all. It's where I can't get results, and I know it's palliative. I try to stay out of the palliative area myself. Yeah, sometimes you get those, uh, those clients that, uh, that come to you. That I have another patient who comes to me every week, uh, and he has uh, Parkinson's. And uh, yep. it definitely helps him to get the, the work done. Uh, and actually, he's a cyclist, so he keeps yes. active. But yes. He uh, has to walk with a cane most of the time just sure. to right. maintain his uh, balance, so to speak, and, and get his legs to actually move. Um, you bet. And I often wonder what I can do to even help him rather than just what I'm doing already. If there's some little secret or something that I'm just not uh, figuring out that I can do to help him even more. I don't know, nor does Juanita seem to know of a secret that you can't be doing that you're not doing. Okay. Be gentle and thorough with your work. And as she suggested, have someone do some gentle uh, draining, you might say. Put the leg in the air and let them just drain it a little bit with some nights, effleurage toward the heart for five minutes on each leg. It could be awesome. Awesome. Good question. Thanks, Gene. Welcome. I'm looking for others on the screen here, Sam. Other questions? Uh, I am looking too. I have not seen anybody yet. If uh, uh, anybody wants to raise their hand or uh, you. type a uh, type your name in the in the chat, we will try and go to you with a question. Thank you, Gene, for breaking the ice, and we're ready to receive other incoming. And certainly, just the comment on the overall stress reduction, Gene. Uh, uh, Conditions like Parkinson are so exacerbated uh, when someone is highly stressed. So anything that you can do to treat the nervous system, of course, to reduce that overall stress level is going to be beneficial. And along with that, Sam, you're so correct. Along with that, uh, work along either side of the spine, working those paraspinals because, you know, that's the area of the spinal nerves. And uh, with many conditions that are debilitating, uh, posture is involved, and those spinal muscles just work so hard. They're the, you know, big workhorses of the body trying to keep the trunk and the, the head erect. And so it's, it's very relaxing to work on the paraspinals, and people can get uh, even more relief because you're working, you know, kind of a central area where the nerve flow is, uh, you know, coming out. We've got access to the, the muscles and all of that area that is uh, relating to those spinal nerves. Yes. So that's a, a good uh, suggestion as well. Don't, don't ever forget the spine. <laughs> the sen central necessity to work the spine. You bet, Juanita. Yeah. Okay, I'm looking for other questions on the screen here. Yeah. Anybody raise your hand? Raise your hand. Well, let, let me just ask a question of all of them. As we've been going through this today, can we get some feedback from you as to whether this is 
uh, you think this is beneficial to talk about, one of the reasons we decided to do it is that we understand that in this country, massage therapy education varies from school to school, state to state, and we never really know when we're teaching individuals what their background is exactly. in anatomy, physiology, and pathology. Sometimes they've had excellent teachers. Other times we've had people come to our course who just are so grateful that we have taken some time to explain some things because they don't know it and they were too shy to raise their hands and say, and what is muscle tone? What is neuropathy? You know, because they yes. feel like they should have known it or learned it in right. school. So can, can you all give us some feedback on, on this? And Because we, we can do this more and we like to do it if you feel like it's something beneficial to review. Uh, uh, that's great, uh, Juanita. We can receive that feedback in a variety of ways um, okay. here in the chat uh, or uh, uh, online in the chat or by email. Kathleen, okay. I saw you raising your hand. Um, let's see if we can go to you and uh, get a question from you. Uh, <clears throat> can you hear me? I, I can hear you. Yes, and see yes you. we can. Okay. This is new to me. State um, your name, please. I'm Kathleen Harris. Hi, Kathleen. Hi. Um, I kind of got on this late. I think you guys all know that. Uh, uh, I'm, I didn't catch part of your conversation, Dave, you know, from the beginning. And listening, I guess we're talking a lot about the nervous system. Uh, you mentioned mononeuropathy, polyneuropathy. Um, Are you finding this information good? Infor yeah, good information I, I, for you? I just, yeah, well, I'm writing down words so I can, you know, look it up and really kind of get more of an understanding of it. So, good. like I said, forgive me. I'm not even sure if I'm really supposed to be on this tonight or not, but. Uh, Are you a student okay. in the master class? You, you, you're welcome here anytime, Kathleen. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Uh, well, I signed up for the seventy-two hour course. Um, well, then you you have you have your ticket to be here. Oh, okay, good, good, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is new to me. I'm on old school, so. Uh, okay, glad you're here. Thank you, but so I think we're studying a lot about the nervous system at this point. Is that? I mean, you you we, we, we were just. I find it very interesting. Okay. Yes, we're talking about nerves and muscles and defining some terms. So I might suggest that you just keep listening and, and pick up everything you can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. And, and Glad this, you're here. Thank you. And this will be posted online. So yes. If that you missed, you can go back. Absolutely. Um, you can go back to uh, look at it. So. That'll be helpful. You won't miss Thank anything. You. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Cynthia is asking about, uh, again, to restate the definition uh, and mm. differentiation between mononeuropathy and polyneuropathy. I got it. Uh, mono means one, poly means many. Mm. Neuro means nerve, and pathy means problem. So a mononeuropathy is generally uh, a a condition where one nerve is being impinged, impacted, or, excuse me, entrapped or compressed. Polyneuropathy is where many nerves are involved. An example of polyneuropathy would be diabetes. An example of mononeuropathy would be cubital tunnel or carpal tunnel syndrome, where one nerve is being affected. So that's the definition that I have. Looking for more questions. Thank you, Cynthia. Got another question, Cynthia? Come on. <laughs> I'm sitting here and... Uh, That's all right. You know, it, it is a process and uh, we are open uh, to hearing what you have to say. 
And um, in lieu of having questions, I, I thought I might just bring up one other issue regarding the nervous system since we're, we seem to be focusing on that tonight. Um, all of us have heard uh, and understand, hopefully, about trigger points. And certainly, the formation of trigger points has a lot to do with what we're talking about tonight because the nervous system is the instigator for the development of a trigger point. Um, trigger points, I mean, the nervous system can certainly be affected by stress, as we talked about. It can be affected by injury and the pain of injury. It can be affected by surgical incisions. It can be affected by poor posture and uh, pressure upon nerves. And so, when we have all these things that can happen to the nervous system and the axoplasmic flow, the speed and, and the, uh, uh, of the neural flow, uh, this can really potentiate the production of a trigger point. Now, within the muscles, we have a neuromuscular junction which is where the nervous system meets the muscle. And so when we have, um, for whatever reason, um, a, an accelerated or a very stimulated nervous system over a long period of time, not just, you know, after an injury, but kind of a sustained chronic type of stimulation, the uh, neuromuscular junction literally changes in its physiology because of the chemistry, and I won't go into the chemistry today because we don't have the time, but there is a chemistry that occurs that where the nerve is telling the muscle to contract. And when that neurological flow is so fast, it changes the physiology at these specific sites where trigger points form. And um, and so I just wanted to, to bring that out so that you understood that the whole trigger point complex and all of the understanding and the knowledge that and the research that has been done in trigger points is very much um, uh, connected to what we're talking about today. Very much so. Yeah. Very much so. Thank you, Juanita, for that information on trigger points. I have a question here. Uh, asking about the brachial plexus, and I'm going to refer you to the MMT1 manual. There's a uh, graphic there showing the five trunks coming from um, C5 through T1, if I recall, C3, C5 through T1, and, and going from five trunks into three cords, or five cords, and then down to three nerves that go down the arm. So rather than give you a list of every condition that possibly could come from the brachial plexus, I'm going to refer you to the MMT-1 and the MMT-2 manual to let you see for yourself all the conditions that can, that can come from um, the ulnar nerve, the median nerve, and the radial nerve. So those are the three nerves that eventuate after the several nerves leave the spine and go under the clavicle over the first rib and down into the arm, forming the three nerves. And I forgot the one, the other one that goes halfway down the arm, the musculocutaneous nerve. So there's right. four nerves right. there for you to look up all the conditions that can come from the brachial plexus. I'm looking for another question. And, and then as we're looking for questions, I wanted to throw out the term innervation just in case uh, some of you may not know what that word means. Innervation means the, uh, the pathway of the nerve as it goes through the muscle tissue. And that's innervation. So we have all these nerves that tell the muscles what to do, and they uh, go within muscle in order to do that. And that's one of the reasons why we have the possibility of entrapment of those nerves because they go through the soft tissue. If soft tissue is injured, if there's scar tissue, if there's functional gluing, um, if, there's, if the tone of the muscle is hypertoned and extremely tight, 
then the possibility exists that whatever nerve is innervating that muscle could be entrapped, and that's why we wind up having painful syndromes with that. Very good. I see uh, let's see if we here. can go to Kerry. I, uh, I see you have your hand raised. Let's see if we can uh, yes, get you uh, going let here. Me, let me do a brief introduction here. You're not the only person in Hawaii that's uh, on the call tonight, Sam. From, uh, from Pahoa in Puna District, we have Kerry Dickey Clark, whom I met in 1989 at the AMT convention in Toronto, and we've been oh, friends yeah. ever since. Kerry has been a teaching assistant. She's assisted me in many classes in Honolulu, and I respect her, her Canadian training very much, and I also love her South African accent. So, <laughs> hi, Kerry. <laughs> Hello, everybody. So what you got? Hi. You got a statement or a question? Well, as, I, as you, I don't know if you can see my video, but I'm uh, actually... I'm I see it. Storage, storage <laughs> Speak. I have, You're not driving, are you? Well, I am because I have to follow somebody out of this storage unit because there's a lock on the gate because I've got my, some of my belongings after I had to evacuate after the lava. So I now I was just driving the car to snuggle up to them so that I can get through the gate at the same time. Anyway, um, I will be on the other side of the street and I will stop shortly and not do this as I'm driving. I just wanted to give feedback um, to you folks about, A, I'm really enjoying the call. It's great. And I really appreciated Sam's additions of definitions. Yes. As we went along, because I was going, okay, I can remember some of that, but uh, it's really good just to have a, a revamp on it. So thank you so much for that. And uh, sure. I came in late because I just bought a car. You see my car, my new car? <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so love to you all. And I'm looking forward to the next gathering. And aloha to everybody. Oh, thank, you, thank you, Carrie. Thanks aloha. for checking in. Bless you. Aloha. David, we have some questions typed out. Lakshmi has one, how to I'm, massage looking, rigid legs. I'm seeing. Juanita, this is for you. How to massage rigid legs from SCI, whatever that is, injury. The legs don't function after an auto trauma. So what was the first part of the question? How to massage rigid legs from an SCI. Injury. Okay, and so I need to know what an SCI injury is. I I'm think I'd want to know that, that too. Uh huh. Jargon is not enough. Lakshmi, what does it mean? Spinal, spinal cord, cord injury. Cord injury. Okay, spinal cord injury. All right. So uh, <laughs> I guess I would want to know uh, if is it? Are you talking about par uh, paralysis? Are they, you know, paralyzed legs that are very rigid, or is there some movement? Uh, it says the here she's all? saying yes. The legs don't move after an auto trauma. Okay, so they're paralyzed, uh, is what I'm hearing. Yes. All right. The the um, there's a there's a lot of ways to look at this when someone is paralyzed and. Uh, because of the fact that the muscles are not moving. Uh, They're in a wheelchair. The, okay. The, the muscles usually atrophy. Uh, our, our concern <coughs> with working with people that have paralysis is circulatory. There's a lot of stagnation of blood uh, because the, the muscles are not moving and contracting anymore. Uh, the same thing with the stagnation with lymph. I think the safest thing, uh, unless, you know, I've only seen one situation where there was someone who had a tragic accident and they were paralyzed and the, uh, the wife of the husband, the very day after, started to massage his legs and did so every day and, and kept those and did range of motion. And, you know, beyond the call of duty, this women, woman, you know, did this. Now, in, that's the optimum type of situation where you can keep muscles moving uh, even passively and with massage. You can keep the circulation going. 
as far as working on someone who's been paralyzed for a while, we would want to stick to something very light like lymphatic massage um, and not manipulate the tissue so much because the potential for blood stagnation and blood clots raises, you know, it's, it's higher after someone is not moving their leg. Sounds like another opportunity now, to teach it, to be a teacher and for the therapist to show the family member if they can do right. just a little bit of each day on the regularity yes. of it. You can't have a yes. person come to you every day in the office necessarily, but at home, hey, that could be a wonderful thing. And I have to say that what we're looking at in the future for people that are paralyzed, this technology already exists, are uh, robotic type of braces for people that are paralyzed, and they will put these braces on, and the robotic part is to do the active range of motion. So, um, and probably some of this is going on in some uh, clinics, you know, maybe with with GIs, maybe, you know, I just don't know. But uh, this all started with Christopher Reeves after his paralysis and uh, much of his money and his wealth went to developing these types of robotic machines that can keep people moving so that the nervous system has a better chance of recovery. Uh, without movement, the nervous system has very little chance of recovery. But with, with lots of movement, it has a much better chance. And, and uh, you add some stem cells in with that, and, you know, we might be seeing the day when paralysis is cured. You know, I don't know whether Dave and I will. We, we may be across the veil when that happens. But, um, you know, that's, that, that's the future and the glimpse of, you know, what might, happening, what, what might be happening with paralysis in the future for an actual cure, which is pretty amazing. Thank you, Juanita. That's good feedback. That's very good yeah. feedback. So enroll, enroll the family to help out would be my right. and lymph, conclusion lymph from that. massage would be, yeah, very <clears throat> light type of effleurage movement. Yes. Okay, here we go. What do we got? Something coming? Uh, Irene, had asked, Irene had asked earlier about the difference between trigger points and pressure points. Could you speak well, to that? I'll, I'll, I'll give my comment. My comment is that there's no such thing as a pressure point. There is, there's a such thing as a trigger point. There is such thing, to, according to the work of Dr. Lawrence, um, uh, strain, counter strain man, uh, he talks about tender points. There are motor points, but there is no such thing in my vocabulary, professionally speaking or anatomically speaking, as a pressure point. No such thing. Um, so I, I will just add to that. Sometimes there has been a slang for acupressure points, right. where instead of being called acupressure points, they just call them pressure points. So I'm not sure if that's what she's relating to, uh, if there was a difference between trigger points and acupressure points. Can she clarify? Uh, we will ask that, and uh, that would okay. be a, a, a different thing. The 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 pressure yes. points for acupressure and the pressure points for acupuncture uh, are, are different than the trigger point system um, yes. that uh, has been developed. Absolutely, the, and yet I was told I, I can't prove this, but I was told that if you overlay the acupuncture points and the trigger point charts, that there's a lot of similarity there. That's what I've been told. There, I'm, there, there I'm are, not a, it, it's not a, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say a lot, I would say okay. some. Okay, yeah. some. Okay, let's go with some. Yeah, they're, they, they are a very different modality, I think. Lower your voice, yes. Sam. Totally different, yes. And Let, you know, oh. they're, they're tender for different reasons. Yeah. All right. Questions on the rise. Let's see. Right, exactly. Anyone have other questions? Okay, folks, time to speak up. 
Juanita asked for feedback on what we've been presenting. Is this helpful to you? We'd just like to get a word or two. Yes, no, boring, uh, heard it all before, or all <laughs> new and wonderful, <laughs> something. Let us hear from you, please. Cynthia typed in and I expressed her appreciation and value. Good, thank you. We certainly appreciate uh, everyone's participation Absolutely. here today. You know, this, uh, uh, this live uh, forum uh, is just part of your uh, uh, subscription to this coursework. Um, the 72 CE hour medical massage therapy masterclass that is delivered <clears throat> online um, that is available uh, to uh, all massage therapists um, as continuing education and CBTMB uh, continuing education hours, uh, 72 home study uh, uh, CE hours and your completion of the six tests online will uh, uh, secure you a certificate of accomplishment for those 72 CE hours. The icing on the cake, of course, is the four-day techniques intensive that David delivers uh, at a variety of different locations around the country uh, several times a year. Um, we've got uh, courses coming up very shortly. David will be hitting the road in just uh, a week or so, headed to Baltimore and then Dallas. Um, and uh, in the spring of next year, we've got classes planned for Las Vegas, Chicago, uh, and uh, Honolulu. Uh, and uh, those are really extraordinary opportunities uh, for you to work one-on-one -on -one with David uh, and to trade the, the massage. You know, the feedback that I get that's so extraordinary is uh, therapists receiving the benefits of these treatments. Um, that's where they really begin to understand uh, what the client is experiencing and they, uh, uh, being on the receiving end of the proper delivery uh, of these techniques makes such a big difference for so many of our students. Uh, I right, see you that. are, Sam. In fact, Juanita and my first teacher, the uh, rather well-known and well-deserved uh, knowledge or well-deserved notoriety, Benny Vaughn, used to say that to be a pro, P-R-O, you have to practice, receive, and observe. And that's all valid. And that's what we do in, in the four-day class. Uh, it's four days of body work with me supervising and me doing some demonstration and you receiving, receiving and giving and me supervising and helping. So it's literally being coming a pro. That's right. Thank you for your kind words. I hear some, I see some kind words. I'm loving it. I do appreciate the valuable input we're receiving. And thank you very much. We, we consider it very important for clinical practice to understand our terms. David, you didn't get uh, mentioned much about the trigger point uh, therapy um, that you do teach. Um, we, you know, uh, would you elaborate on, on what it is that you do, that you do teach in, in terms of the trigger point? points, yes, I'd be happy to. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> In the back of each manual, I am able to give a several pages of typical trigger points that would be found in a variety of muscles. So the instruction is that as we're going along doing our work and we encounter a palpable taut band or or place in the muscle, usually at the musculotendinous junction or in the belly of the muscle, then we would want to follow classic and wonderful trigger point approach. Uh, my approach is that there's two ways to, to fail with a trigger point and there's only one way to succeed. The two ways to fail are to not find it and not be on it. And the other way to fail is to use too doggone much pressure as I used to do, thinking that more, the more pressure, the better. Let's just go for it. 
No, I learned. Yeah. I gradually, uh, reality came into my head with, with teaching, uh, teachings like Juanita's and, and others who would finally get it into my head that it's not a matter of how much pressure, it's a matter of finding the, the space where it's on the verge of discomfort, but not into pain and wow. holding that pressure for a period of say eight to 12 seconds while the therapist and the client, or excuse me, let me reverse that, while the client and the therapist take a deep breath or several and allow that releasing process, that letting go, I ask the client, tell me when it's dissipating. Tell me when it's going or gone. I don't, I don't ask them to, to, to wait until it's completely gone because that may not happen. It usually doesn't, as a matter of fact. But when they say, ah, oh, yes, it's going, often I can feel it going under my thumb or under my thumb saver even, yes, believe it or not. Under the thumb saver, I can feel it going and then I know I can move on and then maybe come back later in the treatment to, to touch it again and see if it is less and hold another short time, allow it to release even more. So trigger point therapy, excuse me again, <clears throat> is a vital part, one of the many modalities that we rely on, that we, that's our foundation of treatment. Trigger point therapy and, and, uh, and release of trigger points is integral to everything we do, as is skin rolling and all manner of the other modalities that you, that you know that we teach in this program, muscle energy technique and so many others. So trigger point therapy is a valid approach. We use it all the time. We teach it all the time. And it's integral to what we're doing. And that's the way I incorporate it into the, the work that I'm doing. And that's the way that I teach it to students. I don't start out with a trigger point chart saying, let's go here and touch and hold. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> David, David, let me uh, talk a little bit while you clear your throat. Please, because I Thank wanted you. I wanted to just go back a little bit and say, especially since we had a question about the difference between pressure points and trigger points. Um, you know, when we find something within a muscle that is suspicious and we challenge it and press into it, uh, what we're looking for is either a radiation of the pain. Uh, well, actually, we're looking to see whether it's even tender. Sometimes we'll feel unusual uh, muscle tissue and we press into it and the person says, no, that's not sensitive at all. And, you know, we may have come across some scar tissue that just feels taut but uh, has no pain associated to it. When something is a trigger point, it either radiates pain or it is triggering pain away from the site. You know, uh, uh, in other words, we might have a trigger point in the back of the scapula, posterior scapula, that is referring right into the shoulder joint. So when we press it, then we know we have a trigger point and we have identified it. And those charts that David talked about shows where the trigger points are. They're, they're the same places in all people. They're at neuromuscular junctions. So we can have these charts that tell us where they are, and then we see where they refer uh, in the chart. And um, some people will have an active trigger point that is so hyperstimulated that they come in with a headache or a chronic pain in a shoulder or in their hip, and uh, they're complaining of having pain right now. And then we, you know, check the trigger point areas and find out that indeed we've got a trigger point that's located in a particular muscle. And then we go about treating it the way that David is talking about. So um, that's what a trigger point is. We also, uh, uh, other than active trigger points, we have latent trigger points, meaning that somebody doesn't come in with a pain complaint. But in the, in the course of a massage, we might be feeling the tissue, feeling the muscle tone, come across an area, challenge it. We ask them about it, and they say, oh, yeah, that's, that's, I feel it when you press there. I feel it over here. What's that all about? And so then we know we have a latent 
trigger point, which isn't uh, as far as severity is concerned. It's not as severe a condition as an active trigger point, but it's one that needs to be addressed uh, because it can get worse over time if it is not addressed and treated appropriately. So I just wanted to add that. Hang on, David. Let me unmute you. Yes, now give that a try, David. Sorry. <clears throat> Thank you, Juanita. That's an excellent response. Okay, good, good. Excellent. Just wanted to fill in some blanks. And, uh, just exactly. in case, you know, there was somebody who wasn't sure what a trigger point was. Absolutely. And yeah. uh, Danielle asked that, uh, you know, she's concerned that she has not learned about trigger points. Um, David, that's, it's in your curriculum. Uh, right so here. doing... Doing this, you know, studying this work uh, and doing this work uh, in the 72, uh, uh, five month, uh, 72 hour, five month uh, online master class, you will learn about trigger points. Yes, it's a wonderful introduction. I can remember very clearly the fact that uh, Dr. Travell's book, volume one from Dr. Janet Travell came out in 1980. Juanita and I finished school in 78 and then we were in two, in two years of practice when that book came out, we had already been studying with Paul St. John, and when that book came out, it was like uh, mana from heaven. I actually wore out. I literally wore the back off of a book by opening it so many times and showing the client, does that look like your pain pattern? Oh, my God, yes, that's, that's exactly it. Aha, uh -huh. well, let's I... go treat those trigger points then. And then we yeah. waited six years, six long years for volume two the lower extremity. And when it came out in 86, the same thing happened. Started using that and showing it to clients and it just blew their minds and that we as simple massage therapists could find and help them with such complicated things as trigger points. And that was the foundation of both of our education. <clears throat> we went on from there <clears throat> into many other trainings to add to our repertoire. And right. the treatment... I, I the, the treatment, sorry, Juanita, the treatment of those trigger points, um, that's where you use so much of that sustained uh, pressure, uh, not necessarily deep, but uh, uh, the appropriate pressure for a sustained period of time. And uh, David, that's where you blew out your thumbs. That's, that was really the genesis of the whole thumb saver uh, 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 tool, hand tools that you uh, created. That's certainly part of it. That's certainly part of it. The idea of yeah. using thumbs and twisting around and applying and, and moving them. It wasn't just the pressing though. It was all of the, all of this kind of movement with the thumbs, the rotating mm -hmm. and the turning it around right. and coming up under and pressing like that in yeah. so many techniques. But yes, right. all of that contributed to my, uh, my, my zeal in using too damn much pressure, if you don't mind me saying so, I've been, I'm as guilty of that as anyone ever has been. I've had people come back sore. I don't mean in the last 25 years. I mean earlier on in my career before I learned that too much pressure is just as, just as bad as not finding it at all. So there's, a, there's a, a, a right pressure. There's an appropriate pressure. And it's up to us to find it, to find That's that right. pressure that is on the edge of discomfort, but any tendency of the client to withdraw, to, to, to withdraw, pull away, means that the therapist right. needs to slow down, back off, or stop. And that's a direct quote from Tom Myers, who wrote Anatomy Trains. And I concur with that wholeheartedly. And since I've been following that pattern more and more in the last 25, 30 years, my right. results have gone up and I do much better work. Yes, people talk about the, the hurt, good, pain, and uh, most massage therapists kind of understand the more they practice what our clients are talking about, that it's deep enough for them to be able to, all, all, just when we go into it and press it with the correct pressure, there's this uh, a feeling of, oh, yeah, right there. Can you stay there for about a day? You know, because yes. it's the right <laughs> pressure. And, and, I've, and, I've said uh, that. <laughs> yeah, yes, I exactly. know you have. <laughs> and so it's, it's deep enough for them to feel that, that relief already, but not so deep that it's, 
it's feeding into the pain loop. That's the problem with too much pressure. Exactly. You've got somebody who's got pain. You do not want to give them more memory to feed into the pain loop. You want to give relief to that. And the relief is the hurt good pressure. That's what it is. That's what and you what want you're to saying, And what you're saying by using other words is, if David uses too darn much pressure, the trigger point's not going to release. It's just not going to that's release. It. Period. That's it. So yeah. that's trigger point therapy, folks. And uh, right. have fun with it. It's wonderful. And you might want the Travel books. And I also want to say, when we're, as we're talking about pressure here, and maybe on another call we'll talk more about muscular physiology, but, you know, one of the things that happened to David and I and many people as neuromuscular therapy became popular was that many people got sort of stuck on neuromuscular therapy as if it was the only thing that was causing pain. And that's really not the truth. I mean, we've got so many other situations with posture, with injuries, with uh, scar tissue problems and, uh, you know, poor health that can contribute to muscle tone being irregular and very hypertoned. And it isn't always associated with trigger points. And yes. so, you know, the, the type of pressure that we use for hypertoned muscle is very similar to what we use to help trigger points release. It's, you know, it's, it's a combination of different type of styles along with hydrotherapy that helps the muscle be prepared for the work. So I just want to be clear with that. And that's one of the reasons why we went on to learn as much as we could about other modalities like myofascial release and the jostling and the rolling and so forth and so on. And even deep relaxation techniques that are uh, very helpful for people exactly. who have trigger point syndrome. So I just wanted to say that, that there's, there's um, you know, a good body of knowledge. Trigger points is an important part of it, but certainly it's not the be-all, end-all of a therapy, you know, for painful conditions. There's lots of great modalities, and yeah. my statement is that I don't know of another training program that has so many different modalities in it, frankly. Yeah, and we try to uh, cover a lot of things because every person's different. Every, every person presents differently, so we want to be armored with as many uh, different, uh, as much different information as we can about anatomy and physiology and kinesiology and pathology, and then let our hands do the walking, and, uh, you know, we tap into our intuition, and we've got lots of different tools that we can use to help various individuals, you know, with wh whatever they're presenting with. That's exactly right. And that's why we're here talking to you now on your quest to become a clinical specialist, to become uh, right. in clinical practice. If you're not already in clinical right. practice, it's well within your reach. You can do right. this. You can do you this. Can. You can do it. And we're here to assist you do it. So we look for your questions. I, we look at that chat just almost every day. I'm looking for questions every single day from you folks out there who are studying. We don't know you yet. When you come to class, I get to know you. But right now, we don't know you that much. You know us better than we know you. And so we want you to uh, use the, the resources that you have right here before you. And that is to ask us questions now and certainly on the chat. Find that chat and use it. Don't be, don't, don't hold back because we right. won't hold back with our answers. I can tell you that right. for sure. We'll tell you everything we, we know. So you ask everything you know to ask. Thanks. We appreciate you so much. Uh, circling back to our original uh, intent, uh, your presentation on some of the technical language, uh, those uh, Danielle asks if these are the terminology to be in soap notes. I didn't understand that. I'm sorry. And I, I would I would guess said. that. Sure. If if these the, the terminology that you've been uh, that you presented here today are those the terms that you would use in soap notes uh, for insurance oh, based yes. clients. Yes. 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 
Yes, and those are technical. With other professionals, right? Yes, those are clinical terms. Right. Those are common clinical terms that all clinical people know. So yes, exactly. Well, I wouldn't say all clinical people know. Well, <laughs> but but some okay. clinical people that that work with the musculoskeletal system, yes, they probably thank you. know them. Right. Thank you. <laughs> right. Uh, Jean had asked a question earlier about uh, uh, having a list on our website, and actually, Jean, that is something that we're working on. We're we are in the process of rebuilding our website. Uh, bringing it up to a modern mobile uh, form. Uh, and it is one of the pages that we're looking at generating uh, to be able to allow our graduates to populate their own little profile uh, and uh, so that uh, people uh, can reach out to them and find them in their communities. So thank you for that interest and support of that concept we are working on. You bet. Thank you, Gene. That's a good one. Uh, I'm not sure if we have any other questions. We we uh, we can continue for a little while, or we can choose to uh, wrap this up today uh, and come back in just about a month. David Juanita, are there additional things that you are uh, moved to present today, or not in lieu of no, questions I... necessarily? I'm I'm eager to hear. I'm afraid if I start talking, people stop writing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, we've been on for an hour and a half. I think we're, it feels like a good place to end. Um, we've talked about the nervous system tonight, and uh, I don't think that we have overwhelmed anybody with the information. Um, so I think hope I not. just feel like it's just right. Yeah, I hope it's just right. I do too. It's yeah. quite a bit to digest. That's an hour and a half of almost uh, class lecture. So uh, right, exactly. That's that's I, a lot I, I of information for some folks. An hour so, and a half is uh, is a lot. So and the good news is fine. that you're not required to memorize it all. You're not required to take a test on it. It's going to be online. You can go review it again, and get right. any more benefit out of it that you can. Should that's we right. study? Should we study trigger point before class starts? I don't know what that means. Um, uh, I, I would, I would say that if if you're you're not familiar with trigger point therapy at all, that you might want to Google it and you know read about uh, what comes up, and to get some other feedback. You know, uh, to learn a body of knowledge, uh, it's generally understood that repetitions of six to ten times of learning something is often required. Uh, from different sources so that you can have a good comprehension of it. So I, I always, I, I'm continually learning online. I love uh, the internet for that reason. And uh, so, there, and there's a lot of information about trigger points out there. So I would never um, say don't go study something. You know, the more you study it, the more you'll understand. Exactly. So go for it. So yeah. yes, be, before class starts and during class and after class and during your <laughs> sessions. And uh, like I say, I, I, in session, I would pull out the Janet Travell book and show it to a client right there. So it's very right. valuable. By the way, another little thing I'll just end with that I've had s several, numerous students say that they, they will play uh, one of the videos uh, from the uh, website on their computer and turn the sound down and play it. Let's say it's on the shoulder. Let's say they've got a shoulder problem coming in. They, they would play the video and, and right there near where they could see it while they were doing their treatment. It gives them a lead in, uh, a little prompt, if you will, for the treatment that they might want to be delivering to that shoulder or whatever part of the body. So just a, a learning trick that others have used. I pass it on to you so that you who are listening can use that as well. How to massage... How to massage head and scalp connective tissue and look for stuck spots. How to do that? Well, first you put your hands on the head and then you begin moving them around and then you find out how tender the person is with their hair. If they can't stand their hair to be touched, then you won't be able to use much pressure as I found out just the other day. 
if a person has says, oh my gosh, that's so great, then take handfuls of hair and, and pull it a little bit and move it around. And you can do a lot of fascial work on the top of the head by moving the hair, by literally squeezing and pulling and twisting the hair with their permission and only to the point of no discomfort, just a, a slight way of doing it. Juanita? And, and when people have neck problems, um, about three to four inches above the hairline uh, posteriorly, uh, to be able to work in that area with friction uh, gives an awful lot of relief for uh, chronic neck pain and also headaches that are associated with uh, the trigger points that are found in the neck muscles. So uh, working, working the area around the occiput uh, above the hairline and, Very and just and Juanita, just above that occiput, remember, about an inch or so above the occiput is the little little dip in spot or little valley on each side where the occipital frontalis muscle is, and that's the one right. that raises the eyebrows. So yes, that's yes. a lovely place to be. Don't stop at the back of the neck. Go right up into the hair right. and into the back right. into the head and all the do the entire head. No problem. Right. In fact, you'll see in our, in our manual, you see ear twisting and ear pulling and hair pulling and hair twisting. It's yeah. all in there. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm shocked in a it's way that, that the, the person who answered the question, asked the question, hadn't seen that, the hair, the hair work. Yeah. Well, and well and um, I, just want to uh, I just want to mention that uh, there's a number of trigger points that refer into the head. The sternocleidomastoid is one of them. And many people have trigger point, chronic trigger point headaches. They're commonly called tension headaches. And uh, other than treating the trigger point itself, because of the fact of the referral that goes into the head, it's very important when you're treating headache patterns to be able to work on the areas where the pain is felt, not just where the trigger point is treated, but the whole referral area with exactly. uh, different types of Swedish massage. Exactly. So, uh, you know, head massage is a very important part of treating neck pain and chronic headache patterns. Absolutely. Absolutely. And David, both yeah. those questions uh, about uh, the, 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 the scalp work and the trigger point uh, come from a student that has just subscribed uh, to oh, our coursework. Okay. Um, so they've okay. barely had the opportunity to crack the book open and uh, start looking at the videos. Danielle, you don't actually have to wait. Uh, our, our official course uh, start date of the next course uh, is September 6th. That's coming up just in a week. Um, but, uh, you know, this course is essentially self-paced. We do uh, deliver and dole out to the content on a monthly basis so that you're not overwhelmed with content because there is so much of it in the course. Um, we have it broken up into monthly segments uh, of the MMT 1 through 5. Um, but you're welcome to dive into that. No need to wait. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, monthly webinar is available to you uh, uh, to bring in any question uh, that you happen to be dealing with, no matter what module you ha are at that time. Um, so uh, here, here. just go, go for it. Yes. Come on in. The water's fine. Right. All right, uh, anything else uh, from our two massage mentors? Uh, otherwise, I think we might wrap up this call. I think we ought to wrap it. Very good. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> thank you, everybody. The more you put into it, the more you get out of it. So thank you for That's putting right. your time into this right now. We appreciate your service to humanity. Absolutely do. Massage is a, is a wonderful <clears throat> profession, wonderful. Everybody needs it. <laughs> well, I know this work has uh, been integral uh, for, for my longevity. Uh, I've had four spinal cord surgeries um, and have uh, benefited a tremendous amount from the work uh, with David, uh, who was my therapist for many years. That's how I got inspired to uh, help document this work and uh, bring it as an online course. And uh, have 
thrilled to be able to have so many students uh, participating with us online uh, and especially coming to the four-day techniques intensive. Uh, we know how difficult it is to travel these days, how expensive it can be, uh, and uh, that so many of you do come out uh, to uh, spend that time with David directly uh, is just a fantastic thing. And uh, we even have Juanita hitting the road uh, uh, and will be joining us uh, to deliver coursework in Honolulu uh, this October. And you are more than welcome to join us for that. Uh, come and study the MMT6 documentation uh, 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 module that Juanita developed uh, and she will be presenting that coursework herself in Honolulu in October, as well as a new course that Juanita has created, a half-day course in ethics for medical massage therapists. Uh, you can find information uh, on both of those course offerings on, uh, the, uh, on the course website. And if you have any trouble, uh, you're certainly welcome to reach uh, any of us or reach me directly. Uh, we get the emails at davidmarin at therapyedu.net. So thank you all. Uh, don't this forget will be to posted ask, don't online. They get a, don't, don't master class students get a discount when they attend the live class? On the, on the MMT-6, it would be considered to be an audit. That's it. That is correct, David. Thank you very much. If you are so enrolled come in to Honolulu the five-month, right? If you are enrolled in the five-month master class, that does include uh, the online version of MMT-6, uh, and that gets you in the door to audit the live version of that same course uh, for one half the tuition. Um, exactly. And uh, if you want to discuss how to do that, again, uh, reach me directly, and we'll be more than happy to assist you uh, coming in and joining us in Honolulu. What a wonderful place to come and study medical massage therapy with David Marin and Juanita Thompson. Thank you all, everyone, for joining us today, and uh, join us again next month. Um, it will be the probably the last Thursday in the month uh, of September. Okay. Everyone be well. Thank you. Thank all. you. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. Good job.